Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, Microsoft. Glad to be here. I'm, my name is Jeff Colon. I'm a group product marketing manager. I work for Microsoft Search Advertising, which is always funny. You have to always note where you work at Microsoft because we're like a city, or actually a nation state unto ourselves in some respects. Uh, really glad to be here to welcome our author for our visiting uh, lecture series. Um, just a personal story in terms of why I wanted to make an intro to Whitney. Uh, I was traveling like a lot of people do at Microsoft probably about four months ago and was walking through an airport and of course like a lot of people I'm like what business books are out that I can read uh, since my Asus Zen book only holds about a 30 minute charge and I can't really do much work on a five hour trip to the East Coast and I came upon Whitney's book and was so excited about it when I got back to uh, uh, one of my group meetings, I, I had said to everyone, everyone needs to read this book. And of course, people who said, I don't really need to read that. I've been here for nine years. I said, that's ex exactly why you need to read this book. So I hope that you'll get a lot of uh, out of her discussion today. Just to give her a, a quick background for everyone here. She was recognized as one of the world's most influential management thinkers in 2015 and is the former president and co-founder of a boutique investment firm with Harvard Business School's Clayton Christensen, who also is the author of uh, The Innovator's Dilemma. Uh, she's the author of the critically acclaimed Disrupt Yourself, Putting the Power of Disruptive Innovation to Work, one of Inc. Magazine's top 100 business books in 2015. She's a frequent contributor to the Har Harvard Business Review, a LinkedIn influencer, co-founder of 40 Women Over 40 to Watch, and was named one of Fortune Fortune's 55 women to follow on Twitter in 2014. She and her husband and their two children live in Lexington, Virginia. So without further ado, let's give a nice welcome to Whitney Johnson. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Six times higher, 20 times greater. That's what the theory of disruption indicates will happen when you pursue a disruptive course. Your odds of success will be six times higher. Your revenue opportunity, 20 times greater. Not just for Microsoft, but for you. You don't need to cope with the force of disruption. You can harness its power and its unpredictability to propel you forward. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to tell you a little bit of my story. In 2005, I was working as an equity analyst at Merrill Lynch. It was my job to issue buy and sell recommendations on stocks like America Mobile, the fourth largest cellular company in the world. One day, I said to a very good friend of mine, I'm going to quit my job. Whitney, have you lost your mind? I knew it was the right thing to do, but it was illogical. I was the top of my game. I had just come back from Mexico for an investor day. And as I sat in the audience with hundreds of other people, Carlos Slim, the controlling shareholder of America Melville, and one of the world's richest people, he ping-pongs with Bill Gates, was quoting my research. He was referring to me as La Whitney. I had institutions like Fidelity asking me for my financial model. And when I would upgrade or downgrade a stock, it would typically move several percentage points. Not only was I at the top of my game, but getting to this place of power and respect was hard won. Fifteen years earlier, I had arrived in New York with my husband so he could pers pursue his PhD in microbiology. I was terrified. I would never have gone to New York on my own. There were so many people and such tall buildings and horror stories about crime and drugs. For the first week, I wouldn't go anywhere by myself. But we had to put food on the table. 
So I eventually had to go out of our 17th floor student housing apartment and get a job. I majored in music. So the obvious choice was Wall Street. Because I had never set foot in any sort of business course, I had no connections in New York and clearly no confidence. I started as a secretary working for a retail broker at Smith Barney in Midtown Manhattan. It was an exciting time to be on Wall Street. It was 1989, and it was the era of liar's poker, of bonfire of the vanities, of working girl. And swept up, I didn't just want a job. I wanted to work on Wall Street. So I started taking business courses at night. And then I had this boss who believed in me, which allowed me to move up from secretary to investment banker. And if you've worked on Wall Street, you know that rarely happens. And then a step back to become an equity analyst. And eventually, I co-founded an investment firm with Clayton Christensen at the Harvard Business School. I would not have known to call it this then. But when I walked onto Wall Street through the secretarial side door, and when I walked off of Wall Street to become an entrepreneur, I was a disruptor. Now, you're probably familiar with the term. A disruptive innovation is an innovation that's a low-end or new market innovation that eventually upends an industry. So for example, we all know GM was disrupted by Toyota. OK, in a minute, you're going to get to do this with me. Sears was disrupted by Target. Borders was disrupted by Amazon. Now. This one you've got. Yellow cabs by Uber and hotels, which I feel terrible because I'm staying at this hotel, is disrupted by Airbnb. Now in my case, I started at the bottom, I climbed to the top, and now I wanted to up end my career. Lost your mind. You can only get this if you have children. But if you have children, you totally understand that they look at you like this. Okay. According to the theory, a disruptor secures a foothold at the low end of the market. Think Amazon in the 90s. Initially, its products are inferior. Its position is weak. Barnes and Noble and Borders could have crushed them like a cockroach. But they didn't. Market leaders rarely bother. It's just a silly little product. Let's go after bigger, faster, better. The problem is, is that once a disruptor gains a foothold, it too is motivated by bigger, faster, better. And by the time a counterattack does make sense, say it with me, it's too late. To be fair, the low end disruptors, they're really easy to miss. In 2002, I started to build my model on America Mobile. And one of the key inputs for this model was wireless penetration. At this point in time, wireline penetration or fixed line penetration in Mexico was 15%. Wireless was 25%, but it was up from 1% five years earlier. So the question is, how much more can wireless penetration increase? Based on the demographics, the number of people who could afford a phone, who had access to credit, I thought maybe, possibly, maybe penetration can increase from 25% to 40%. Enter Carlos Slim. He saw a much bigger opportunity. Sure, he saw the 40% or the 40 million people I saw, but he saw another 50% or 50 million people who wanted to be connected but couldn't afford to. So what does Carlos Slim do? He offers them subsidized handsets, prepaid phone cards, making affordability and credit a non-issue. Sure, sound quality is bad for this silly little product, but bad sounds better than no sound. Today, wireline penetration in Mexico has increased a paltry five percentage points from 15 to 20%. Wireless is up from 25%, not to 40%, but if you're doing your math, you got it, 
90%. One of the reasons that disruption is so hard to spot is the timing. Growth can be totally flat for years and then suddenly spike upward. Wireless was introduced in Mexico in 1988. For almost a decade, penetration was less than 1%, a decade. And then from 1997 to 2002, whoop, to 25%. When an industry is in upheaval, booyah, say the 50% or 50 million people who are now connected, but for the individual experiencing a seismic shift in what the world looks like, it can be unsettling. Each of us has a view of the world that is powered by our personal algorithms. We look at all the individual components of our personal social system and how they interact, and we come up with patterns to predict what will happen next. When systems behave linearly and react immediately, we're fairly accurate with our forecast. You flip a switch and boom, the light goes on. But when they don't, our predictive power plummets. One of the best ways to make sense of this non-linear world is the S-curve. Just as the S-curve helps us gauge how quickly an innovation will be adopted, it also helps us understand the psychology of disruption. If, for example, you started out at the low end of the curve, you know that growth is going to be slow. Once a tipping point is reached to typically 10 to 15%, you enter hypergrowth, and at the high end of the curve, you reach saturation, or 90%. Facebook, for example. Assuming a market opportunity of a billion people, which it's now exceeded, it took Facebook roughly four years to reach a tipping point of 10%. But then at once it reached this critical mass of 100 million users, it entered hypergrowth. And over the next four years, it added not 100 million, but 800 million users. Now, we could quibble over whether or not it has reached saturation, but there is no question the rate of growth has begun to slow. Now, what I find fascinating and encouraging is that the S-curve also helps us understand the psychology of disruption. If you, for example, just started a new job or just launched a new product, the S-curve tells you that initially progress is going to be slow. This helps you avoid discouragement. Then as you put in the hours of practice, of deliberate practice, you accelerate into competence and confidence. And this is the exciting part of the curve where all of your neurons are firing. Then as you approach mastery, you'll be able to do things automatically, very easily. But because you're no longer enjoying the feel-good effects of learning, boredom and complacency kick in. If at this point you don't jump to a new curve or aren't allowed to jump, your plateau can become a precipice. There are volumes of research indicating that the odds of success improve for products, services, companies, even countries. But the fundamental unit of disruption is the individual. The best way to drive corporate innovation is through personal disruption. If you can surf the S-curve waves of learning and mastering, you will have a competitive advantage in an era of accelerating disruption. And whether an organization, whether Microsoft or you, I've identified seven accelerants that will help you move along the curve. Number one, take the right risks. Now, there are two kinds of risks I'm going to talk about. There's competitive risk and there's market risk. First, competitive risk. If one of your colleagues comes to you and says, there's a huge market opportunity out there and I have got the projections to prove it, it's likely someone's already scoped out the market. There's a kingpin and it ain't you. So you can be confident that there will be customers, but you're going to have to gauge if you can compete and win. This is competitive risk. If a colleague comes to you and says, 
I don't know if there's a market. I, I really don't, but I think there's a need not being met. There's no guarantee that there will be customers, but if there are, and there's no competition, as the first mover, you are favored to own the market. That's market risk. So how does this apply to you as individuals? 19 years ago, right after my son was born, who's obviously now 19, I was hired into equity research. And I was going to cover the cement and construction sector. And believe it or not, I was really excited. I'd started to build my model. Smith Barney announces it's going to merge with Solomon Brothers. And guess what? They already had a highly ranked cement and construction analyst. Hmm, cement? Shoes. However, there were a number of media companies going public and no analyst to cover them. As the theory of disruption would dictate, rather than knocking on a cement door that was closed, I built my own media door. And within a year, I too was a ranked analyst. Now here's the rub as you think about yourself and your team. Competitive risk feels less risky because it's more certain. But if you can deal with the uncertainty of market risk, then you're more likely to be successful. And then you walk through the door of market opportunity by playing to your distinctive strengths. And that's number two. A distinctive strength being something that you do well that other people within your sphere do not like a fish out of water. Let me give you an example. Janie Juvan is a partner at a law firm in Cleveland. And when she was a second year associate, her mother got sick with cancer. So she went online trying to figure out what was happening and she discovered this huge support group. At the same time, she's a second year associate and she's got this requirement that she needs to network. So she can't go out at night because her mom's sick why not network online? Well, her partners, of course, thought this was a crazy idea. Law firms tend to be pretty conservative, but she persisted. In 2008, when the downturn came, she was able to sidestep layoffs because she'd actually landed clients via social media. And when she was up for a partner, she was able to make a very compelling case. Now this is after the fact, the fish out of water, the swim, social media fish swimming in, in legal waters. But most of us struggle to know what our strengths are in the first place. So let me give you a few clues. First of all, what makes you feel strong? Marcus Buckingham says that our strengths clamor for our attention in the most basic way. Using them makes you feel inquisitive, invigorated, successful. Another way you could think about it is what's your go-to activity when you're really stressed out? Now, I'm not talking about eating a quart of haagen dazs ice cream or going out and getting sloshed. I'm talking about that activity, whether it's a spreadsheet, whether it's code, whether it's making sale, that making a sale, that thing that you do it allows you to feel in control again. Order is restored because you feel in control. You feel in control because you feel strong. The trick is, is to figure out how to use this strength deliberately and not just when you're in a bind. What exasperates you? The frustration of genius is in believing that if it's easy for you, it must be easy for everybody else. It may not be that the people around you are incompetent, though they may be. It may just be that you are prodigy-like in this one area. You don't know how to tell people how to do what you want done because you don't know how you know. The next time you find yourself exasperated, consider the possibility that people are bumping up against your genius. What do other people say you do well? And specifically, what compliments do you dismiss? If to a particular compliment, people, you, you find yourself just saying, it was nothing, 
Because for you, it is nothing. It's as natural as breathing. Or if they say to you, they give you a compliment, and you think to yourself, oh, that compliment again. Why can't they compliment me on this other thing that I worked really, really hard to learn? People tend to overvalue what they aren't and undervalue what they are. It's quite likely that compliment is pointing you in the direction of one of your greatest strengths. In fact, it's quite possible that your superpowers are not on your resume because you overlooked or ignored them. If you want to fly up the S-curve, bring your superpowers to work and then play where no one else is playing. Number three, embrace constraints. Whenever you try something new, you're upending your status quo and you want, you need lots of feedback. And so one of the best ways to get this feedback is to impose constraints. Think about skateboarders. They're some of the quickest learners in the world because they receive incredibly fast and useful feedback. Every action, every move has an immediate consequence. Did you know that some of the most famous scenes in Jaws came about because the mechanical shark that Steven Spielberg wanted to use, it didn't work. He was over budget and behind schedule, so he finally decided to film the scenes from the shark's point of view and let the music, everybody can hear it in their mind, and the imagination do the rest. Most of us are like Steven Spielberg. We don't have enough money, which usually is a pretty good thing because when you have a do or don't eat situation, you're pretty incentivized to get the business model right. In 2007, Entrepreneur Magazine compiled a list of the 500 fastest growing companies in the United States. Now, what was unusual about this list is they looked at how these companies had funded their growth. Here's what they found. Only 28% had access to bank loans or lines of credit. Only 18% had access to equity, and only 4% had access to venture capital. What this means is that at least 50%, as much as 72% of these companies had bootstrapped or built their businesses with what they had on hand, and 61% were profitable within the first year. So I ask myself, was Steven Spielberg were these entrepreneurs successful in spite of or because of their constraints? In 1954, an editor at Houghton Mifflin read the now famous article, Why Johnny Can't Read. He was concerned, so he reached out to an editor friend of his. He said, I need you to take 225 unique words every six-year-old knows and write me a story they can't put down. At one point, he was so discouraged, it took him 18 months. But when he finally published The Cat in the Hat, it was an instant success. Years of reciting rhymes, of creating cartoons, of leveraging what he did uniquely well, prepared Theodore Geisel to reinvent children's literature when presented with a 225-word constraint. For disruptors, constraints are not a check on absolute freedom. They're a tool of creation. Number four, battle entitlement. This is the belief that I exist, therefore I'm entitled. And no, it's not just millennials. In fact, the more successful we become, the more we think we deserve our success. Sadly, I see entitlement in myself all the time. It comes in many guises, like cultural entitlement. We all need to feel that we belong. A sense of belonging gives us the confidence that we need to climb a new curve. But as we begin to see the fruits of taking the right risks, of playing to our distinctive strengths, it's easy to believe that this is the way things will and should always be. 
when my husband was studying microbiology, he would grow cells in these beautiful pink colored media. After three or four days, the cells would use up all the nutrients and they'd produce byproducts, some of which were toxic. He'd have to replate the cells into a new petri dish. We may like our cultural petri dish. We may feel we belong. But if we want to avoid stagnation, if we want to avoid toxicity that pushes us back down the curve, occasionally we need to transplant ourselves to new cultures. A very practical way of doing this is to simply open up our network. Now, a closed network, of course, reinforces our sense of belonging. But we hear the same ideas over and over and over again. An open network can be psychically somewhat painful, but we're more likely to have breakthrough ideas. Let's look at the science. A study was done out of Northwestern, and they looked at 18 million academic articles written over the course of a decade. They classified them into high-impact and low-impact papers. So the high-impact papers were papers that people read and then talked about, low-impact not so much. For the low-impact papers, 100% of their sources were highly conventional, people and ideas from inside of their network. For the high-impact papers, 85 to 95% were conventional, the usual suspects. The 5 to 15 percent were highly novel, people and ideas outside of their network. Now, when we think about networking, we tend to think of it in this, how shall I display my largesse sort of way? But sometimes, opening up our network actually requires humility. It puts us in a one-down position. So when I was thinking through my ideas of the S-curve, I reached out to an MIT-trained systems engineer and computer scientist. I will concede that there were times when I said to him, I have no idea what you're talking about. But because I was willing to move beyond my current intellectual borders, I was able to have a breakthrough in my thinking. And in fact, here's what the research found. When these scientists or these academics were willing to transplant themselves intellectually, they were two times more likely to have a high impact paper. If you want to move up the curve, if you want to go into hypergrowth, if you want to stay there, battle entitlement, which sometimes means you're going to have to take a step back in order to grow. When organizations get too big, they often stop exploring smaller opportunities because the revenue, it's just not big enough. Just as Barnes and Noble and Borders were slow to embrace e-commerce, people can stall at the top of their learning curve. And the way to avoid this is to jump to a new curve. This does not necessarily mean that you need to change companies, you need to leave Microsoft, or that the people who work for you need to leave Microsoft. In fact, in the best companies, people are able to disrupt from within. Dave Blakely started his career at IDEO. You're probably familiar with it. It's a design firm. And he was an engineer. He could have worked his way up to manage technical staff. But instead, he volunteered to become a project manager, which many of his peers dismissed as an escape route from the rigor and detail of engineering. But this backward move allowed Blakely to begin to climb a new ladder. And when he completed his 25-year tenure at IDEO, he was the head of technology strategy. As you look to tilt the odds in your favor, beware the undertow of the status quo. Lots of people may like you right where you are. You may like you right where you are, but there really is no such thing as standing still. And sometimes, sideways turns into a slingshot. Sometimes, too, there's failure. Whenever we try something new, there's this fantasy of a simple, linear world. You'll work hard and your dreams will come true. But sometimes they don't. My moments of humiliation include bombing a speech in front of hundreds of people, being fired, and backing a business that imploded. When I fail, no matter how many chirpy quotes I tweet, I am despondent, I'm pessimistic, and I want to move to another city because I can never show my face in public ever again. 
Marjorie Howell said, there is dignity in suffering, nobility in pain, but failure is a salted wound that burns and burns and burns again. Brene Brown said, failure is especially acute for corporate professionals. When the ethos is kill or be killed, control or be controlled, failure is being killed and it elicits tremendous shame. That business that I backed, well, no, let me start with another place. That speech that I bombed, by the time I finished, I had beads of sweat dripping down my face. I looked like I had just run three miles. When I was fired, I was so devastated, I thought I would never recover emotionally. And the business that I backed, how could I claim to be a savvy investor? When I fail, I'm not only embarrassed, but I'm, I'm heartbroken because I had envisioned a future in which I would achieve a goal, perhaps even be hailed the conquering hero, and then I didn't, and I wasn't. It's important to grieve. And then you have to ditch the shame because when we buy into the shame, we allow the failure to become a referendum on us. And we can no longer ask that question, what important truth did I learn because of this failure? So for example, the business that imploded, I learned that I need to vet prospective partners more carefully, especially friends, which I now do. The most important thing I've learned is that whether I see an experience as a failure or a success, it's a choice. About a year and a half ago, I was giving a speech in Portland, Oregon to about 2,500 people. And the gist of the speech was different than it is today. It was, a, it was based on Jungian psychology and, and trying to persuade the audience to put as much emphasis on feminine characteristics such as connection as we do on masculine characteristics such as power and achieving. Speech was off to a great start until about 20 seconds in when I completely forgot what I was going to say. Technical term is I went up. So I'm walking across the stage, just a minute. I really can't fake it, just a minute. When someone sitting right over where you are hollered, you can do it, Whitney. And with that, my memory came back. A few hours later, my agent texted me, so how did it go? Huh, well, how did it go? Because according to the metric of power and achieving, it was the worst speech I'd ever given. I forgot what I was going to say on stage in front of 2,500 people. But according to the metric of connection, it was the best speech I'd ever given. So now I had to decide, was it the best or the worst? It was hard. You don't work on Wall Street without valuing power and achieving, but I ultimately chose best. Paraphrasing John Milton, the mind is its own place. It can make of every heaven a hell, of every hell a heaven. The mind is its own place and can make of every success a failure, of every failure a success. As you climb your learning curves, what will you make of your experiences? Okay, number seven and the last one, be discovery driven. As a disruptor, you are in search of a yet to be defined market. You're taking a market risk. You're playing where no one else has played. This requires an emergent strategy. Rather than developing a step-by-step -step plan to achieve a goal, you take a step forward, you gather feedback, you adapt accordingly. Probably means you'll end up in a place you had not anticipated and you will not be alone. 70% of all successful new businesses end up in a different place too. Groupon started out as an activism platform, bringing people together to fundraise for a cause or to boycott retailers, which I find ironic. Netflix started out as a door-to-door -door DVD rental service. We all like to make plans for the future, but pursuing a disruptive course requires that you cannot see the top of the curve from the bottom, and sometimes you can't see the bottom from the top. You also need to get your metrics right. Metrics are, in fact, a de facto constraint. 
because they give you lots of information. There's a myriad of metrics you can use to measure your progress. Think about Moneyball. But there's only one metric that always matters, and that's how many times you show up. Did you know that the odds of a scientist writing a groundbreaking research paper are directly correlated to not how smart the scientist is, but to how many papers the scientist has written? Not how smart, but to how many. Once a startup makes it to the final round of a pitch contest, there's no statistical difference between the returns of the finalists and the actual winners. It's called the equal odds rule. If you want to write a paper that people read, you publish. If you want a product that sells, you sell. And if you want to get good at jumping from one learning curve to the next, you jump. A simple metric, show up and keep showing up, especially when you are scared. And this is the other thing that the textbooks on disruption don't tell you. Disruption is, by definition, scary and lonely. Perhaps you've had the experience of announcing to the market an initiative you believe will be game-changing, only to discover that your customers, they hate it. Then there's personal disruption, like when I left Wall Street. After the initial rush of excitement wore off, I felt a loss of identity. I could no longer call people and say, Whitney Johnson, Merrill Lynch, now it was just Whitney Johnson. Some days, that wasn't enough. There have been other days where the PE or puke to excitement ratio is so uncomfortably high, I feel like I'm on a thrill ride to zero cash flow. It doesn't mean you shouldn't disrupt. It just means if it's scary and lonely, you're probably on the right track. In fact, if you have that feeling in the deepest part of yourself that you need to try something new and you don't, you'll die inside just a little. That's why we call it the innovator's dilemma. Whether you innovate or not, you risk downward mobility, which is why our dreams are so important, why we have to bring our dreams to work. When we dream, we hunger for a better life. When we dream, we become problem solvers, letting nothing stand in our way. Dreaming is the engine of disruption. And the odds of success are six times higher, the revenue opportunity 20 times greater. Do I dare, do I dare, do I dare disturb the universe? Most of us are pretty adept at doing the math around the future when things are linear, but neither business nor life is linear. And what the brain craves, even requires, is the delicious dopamine of the unpredictable. Saul Kaplan, the chief catalyst of the Business Innovation Factory, said, my life has been about searching for the steep learning curve, swinging like Tarzan from one curve to the next, because that is where I do my best work. And when I do my best work, money, stature, and happiness have always followed. We give a lot of airtime to building and buying disruptive companies, and we should. But innovation ultimately begins on the inside. We start at the low end of the curve. We shift into gears that will allow us to scale. And when our learning peaks, we do what all great disruptors do. We walk straight into the innovator's dilemma and jump to a new curve. Because companies don't disrupt, people do. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Ask that people use the, one of these, a microphone, so that we can hear it online. And don't be shy. Ask whatever you want. Yes? What is my dream? Oh, see, that's a good one. He throws down the gauntlet right off the bat. OK, well, I have two sort of near-term dreams. So one of my dreams is to, I guess I have to be honest, don't I? I have to say what, what it really is. OK, one of my really big, big dreams is to eventually have a book that's a New York Times bestseller. 
So that's one. And then another dream, which I have more control over, is to have a happy family. And so far, so good. Thanks for asking. This bring it closer. Pardon me? I mean, this will bring you closer. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> sure. Come on. Do you, have, do you have a question, comment, thoughts? Yeah, I'm calling on him. I'm cold calling. Whatever you want, whatever you're thinking. I've gone through repotting my career a number of times, started a couple of companies and now at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. um, I have also read that when uh, you are looking for a successful career, it matters that you're deep in a given area um, and continue working on it rather than a jump from one to the other. And here you're proposing a counter theory. How do you reconcile between the two? Well, you're absolutely right. In fact, um, I'm working on a paper right now that suggests that um, deep domain exper expertise is very valuable and important. And in fact, when you have deep, but, but here's the thing, when you have deep domain expertise, you're actually very marketable. And you're, the, the compensation data shows that it behooves you to actually change every three or four years. So, so you want deep domain expertise, and in fact, you're going to maximize your earnings if you're willing to jump. Now, ideally, if you're really good at what you do, Microsoft allows you to continue to jump internally, and your salary continues to go up. And your boss is going to hate me right now, but there you go. Yes. So I just started a new role a week ago that's uh, very different than my old role. It's the same title and everything, but it's completely different domain. Um, and how do you, what's your suggestion to best um, leapfrog those moments of, well, I don't know enough yet towards becoming influential and, mm -hmm. and knowing when that okay. right moment is? All right, so if you take a look at this, if you map this curve against the 10,000 hour rule, which is a great rule of thumb, if you're working 40 hours a week, what that 10,000 hour rule suggests, if you do some quick math, is it's gonna take you roughly six months in order to accelerate. So what I would say to you is one of the best ways to leapfrog this is on the one hand, you can work more hours, but on the other hand, what I would say is if you know that you're at the low end of the curve, then if you can be patient with yourself and just say, I don't know what I'm doing yet, but I know I don't know what I'm doing and I'm not supposed to know what I'm doing and allow yourself to just immerse yourself and develop and grow, you're more likely to move quickly because you're not gonna be getting on, you know, sort of bludgeoning yourself with the, how come I don't know how to do this yet? Because you'll just say, of course I don't know, but in six months I will. And if you are patient with yourself, you'll probably get to that point faster. Okay, let's hear from this side of the room. Who wants to go? I've got one online question. Okay. Someone's just wondering um, how to really know if it's the if it's a right or wrong risk. Oh, and at what great point do you question. stop risking? Great question. Okay. So um, four questions that I came up with to answer that question. Number one is um, first of all, they're not going to like this answer, but you know how I said that the odds of success improve they're six times higher. That goes from six percent to thirty six percent. So there's still a 70 70, no, 64% probability that it won't work. So you need to be aware of that. But in the meantime, the way that you can know if you're taking the right risk is number one, are you playing where no one else is playing? Number two, are you playing to your strengths? One of the things that's really difficult here is that so many of us, because we don't value our strengths, we tend not to play to them. Think about that. Are you really playing to your strengths on the job? The third thing you want to consider is when you're looking at your learning curve, is it hard or is it frustrating? Because if it's hard, then you should keep going. If it's frustrating, the research actually says that's a signal to you that you may be on the wrong curve. And then the fourth thing that you look at is, am I gaining momentum? You're going to have to pick some metric to look at. It can be I asked fewer questions this week than I did last week. Whatever metric you prove, you choose, are you gaining momentum? Is it speeding up? Is the rate of growth increasing? 
And if it is, then you have enough, then you stay on that curve until you have enough information to know to stay off that curve. And I actually wrote a piece about this. So if you email me, I can send you the link to it so you can look at it more closely. Okay. Thanks. Um, I've been in the learning curve uh, quite a bit and I've continually transitioned throughout my career. But I feel like in the last, you know, six, eight years or something like that, I've kind of stalled. Yep. Um, any words of advice? Yes. From that perspective? Does your boss know you've stalled? Kind of. Okay. So what I would say there is, first of all, explain this to them. Because if you're working 40 hours a week, after five years, you're at the top of the curve. And the brain science says that you are only going to, you're going to actually maximize your performance when you're in the sweet spot. Yeah. And so stretch assignments aren't just for junior employees. They're for seasoned employees who have been in a role a long time. And so what you want to do is say, look, number one, brain scientist says, I'm going to be more able to contribute to the firm if you push me to a new curve. And the people that are coming up behind me, this gives them a chance to achieve mastery. And we know that the research the research tells us that the best performing companies are those that prepare competencies before they need them. And so I think that's one way to start the conversation with your boss. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks. Good. I've got another online question. Um, she asks, how much of disruption is attributed to luck being at the right time at the right and the right place? There's always luck. I mean, if you were to do an R squared, you couldn't get to 100%. Um, and luck is just part of life. What I will say to you is that no S-curve is ever wasted. So even if you're on an S-curve and it doesn't work out, and it may not, if you show up, and that's why I wanted to really emphasize this idea of show up, we've all had experiences, and I said, on failures. Do we turn that failure into success? We've all had failures that, you know, experiences that didn't work. And yet I would, I would hazard a guess that nearly every single one of you in this room would say, that one of the experiences that has made you the person that you are sowed its seeds in a failure. Almost to a one, I could probably predict that because I think it's true. We gain strength from our failures. And so I would say, I don't remember what the question was. I got off in what I was saying. Uh, About luck, yeah. Luck, oh yeah, luck plays into it. But like I said, no curve is ever wasted. Someone was gonna raise their hand. And let's make this our last question. Okay. One more person on the spot. Okay. Can you talk about your strategies for staying discovery driven? Is it, is it surrounding yourself with people who are naturally interested? Is it reading any literature in particular? How do you stay discovery driven? That's a really good question. Um, I think absolutely because your point is, well, first of all, I haven't actually thought about the question exactly how you phrased it. So I'm thinking more of discovery driven from a planning perspective and you're saying stay curious. Um, two things, number one, if you're around people who are willing to open up their networks, that's going to allow you to stay, um, stay discovery driven. And the second thing is, is that knowing that the science says that you're gonna get bored at the top of your curve, you wanna make sure that you're putting yourself into some type of new role every three to four years. And that's, those two things, I think, are the most important. Great. Thank you very yep. much. Whitney, thank you so yes, much for thank coming. thank you for being here. So Whitney will be signing. She'll be at the front desk. And there are still $10 books left.